Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to Searching Public Records. Um, my name is Amy and I uh, do a lot with um, the education committee over at JBOR and everything, but this class is near and dear to my heart. Um, if you don't, if you've, if you've, you've probably never met me, I will, I will say that you've probably never met me in person. Um, but if, if you don't know who I am from emails or anything else, I have been a broker in charge for a long time. My company or my team does mostly new construction. Um, so pulling these types of public records is very important to us, especially in new construction. A lot of times when you um, get a listing, it is just a piece of dirt. There's not a house there. There's not anything to show people you know, what it's going to be. And so we are very, very aware that uh, our, our buyers are buying property as well as a house. And I think sometimes realtors get caught up in the house. Uh, but if you look at our lovely preamble to our code of ethics, you know, everything that we do starts out with, you know, first of all, above all, all of that, there is the land. So I, that's, that's my main thing that I want to get across to you guys today is when you are selling houses and listing houses, they aren't just the houses. We are, it's the real property, which means that it's the, the surface of the ground. It's the subsurface rights. It's the air rights. It's everything that you learn in pre-licensing that we then promptly forget about because we're more excited about the, you know, the open concept and farmhouse sinks and white quartz countertops and all of that. But that is not what real estate is. That's not the be all and end all. So we always want to make sure that, you know, as your clients know as much about the property as they possibly can. Everything that I am showing you is something that they could even find themselves. These are all absolutely public records. We are not getting them from anything other than the county, the state, anything like that. So this is all public record. The Real Estate Commission tasks us with being reasonable and prudent. Um, as I was saying a little bit before we started, if there's ever something that you can't find, if you can't find an old septic, if you can't find an old deed, but you've looked for it and you've looked diligently, you've done your job. Um, if you know there's somebody else you can reach out to, you should probably do that as well. But the Real Estate, uh, the Real Estate Commission and our Board of Realtors and uh, the regional MLS, nobody tasks you with being an expert at absolutely everything, but they do task you with knowing enough uh, to give your people the information that they need. And I truly, truly believe that that does mean also, uh, are they in flood zones? Um, do they have wetlands on their property? You know, how to read a deed, all of that kind of stuff. So that's what we're going over today. Heather will send out to everybody who attended today some handouts afterwards. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing right now. I apologize for not being on your screens. The computer that I use somehow will not let my video work, but it will let the screen share work. So um, we will go kind of straight to that. Um, and these are some of the things. So I'm going to send you guys all this that you can see on the screen right now. This is the class that we're going over. So even if you did not take this class from me or listen to it on video or anything like that, this sheet is done so that you could step by step just read these instructions and know how to do this. This also means that you can take this sheet and pass it to anybody in your offices and they should be able to do the same thing, okay? And please feel free to do that. This is, you know, we're not selling out this class so that we can only the people in it get this, this little handout or anything. It is for absolutely every real estate agent out there. The more of us that know how to do more things, the better all of our lives are going to be. And I, I really do mean that. So please pass this along to anybody who has any questions and feel free to let them know that they are welcome to ask me questions anytime. I will put my contact information on, in the chat screen for everybody to have, but if you ever lose that and can't remember who I was or whatever, if you just contact JBOR, they will put you in touch with me if it's a simple question or even if it's something that we need to dive into together. I'm always, you know, ready and willing to learn something new. So if, if there's other stuff that you know that I don't, please let me know as well. Um, so the crux of this comes, um, and I, like I said, when I have agents that work for me, we have these contract checklists that I'm sure pretty much everybody has, but I really do mean when I'm doing mine, 
that before the offer is made, right? We should have the working with real estate agents. We should have them talking to a lender. We should send them a buyer agency and we should send them the home inspections brochure, the professional services disclosure, at least a sample of it and a sample of the offer to purchase form 2T because the buyer agency says that we will give them all of these things or there is at least check boxes for them, but why not send those? When the offer is made, all of these things, all of you know their, the sheets and the addenda, but this is what we're talking about today. If you work for me or if you work anywhere near me or anything like that, I'm always going to insist that my agents know how to find all of these things and that they provide them to their clients. I'm also a big believer in making sure that anything that I have is in flex documents. If it's important enough for me to have looked up, I believe that it's as a listing agent, I, I believe it's important enough for a buyer agent to have and for their buyers to have. In this sense, there are some things that, of course, like blueprints for builders or something like that, that they don't want passed along. Of course, we would not do that. But um, for public records, you know, those those definitely should go to everybody. And I really do mean when the offer is made. Um, why I say that, and we'll get to that as we kind of go through examples of what can go wrong with all of this stuff, but, you know, you want to see the septic permit or possibly even the sewer permit before the offer, you know, when the offer is being made, because what if they have six children and it's a three bedroom septic house, the county says they can't live there. You can, if you have a three bedroom septic house, you can only have six people living in the house. Um, sewer permits now, uh, the pluris permits and everything, and I'll show you where those are, are also actually putting a cap on the amount of people that are in a house because it matters how much water can, can run through there. Uh, the plat maps, you know, if, if they needed a 20 by 20 shed and there's a bunch of wetlands, they might not be able to do that. That might not be the house for them. If they're close to the top of their budget and now their house is in a flood zone and they are going to need additional flood insurance, they might not qualify for that house. So all of these things are important at the beginning. If you can't find them before they go under contract, you should definitely find them before they finish their due diligence period. But if you can get all of this information to them before they go under contract, before they fall in love with that house would be even better. But before they go under contract would be fantastic because any, any one of these things could knock this out of being the house for them. Okay. So like I said, and I'll send this out to Heather has these and she can send them to you. Um, so like I said, these are just the things that we've noticed on most contracts you're probably gonna wanna have, but this is the section we're focusing on today. And I have the same thing for listings, um, slightly different order and all of that kind of stuff. But all of these things are things that I've found over time. I wanna make sure my agents have time and time again. Okay, so now let me go back to why did that thing disappear? Okay. All right. So are you, can everybody, can somebody give me a thumb up or unmute yourself and just make sure that you are seeing the one that says searching for public records 2021? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I can kind of see the chats coming up, but kind of <laughs> they're in a whole different little corner. Okay, cool. So the very first thing that I want to go over, like I said, I said to a couple of the people who were in here before we started recording, most of what we're doing today is Onslow County. Um, that's what we focus on because we happen to be in Onslow County and because their websites work really well. But this thing up at the top in blue, this www.rereference.com, and you will get this sheet, so don't worry about writing too much of this down if you don't want to. But this is a site that's maintained by Al Wagner. Um, and he has put this together so that, um, you know, and, it, and it's, a, it's a sheet that just encompasses pretty much everything. So if you go to the site, and we'll start at the top. So useful websites for realtors. And if you have anything, any suggestions for him or whatever, just let him know. But, you know, it gives you links to Flex and to Onslow County GIS, which is what we're going over today a lot. Um, but, you know, FEMA flood mapping, all of that, this USDA property eligibility sites on here. This is just such a great resource. Um, and then on top of that, down here, we also have the county link. So like I said, we're going to talk mostly about Onslow County. But if you wanted to do Carteret, he's got all of these already bookmarked for you where it's really easy to find. 
Now, you know, I'm a big believer in telling people, have you tried Googling that yet? Because I promise you that if, if you put in the Google search bar, Cape Carteret GIS, you will get the Cape Carteret GIS system on there. But what a fantastic um, resource from Al. Um, and we're always, you know, very thankful that he has all of this on here. So definitely check out that website. And like I said, you can always let him know if for some reason um, he's missing something or a link is broken or whatever. So that's the first one. But for Onslow County, the place where I always start, and I promise you this is going to look like a lot of information and it's going to take us a while to go through everything. But once you get proficient at doing this, you can pull all of these public records in five to 10 minutes. It really does not take long. Okay. Uh, now reading through all of them and understanding what you're getting might take you a little bit longer, but to actually just pull everything, it really does not take very long. So please, um, you know, don't look at this and be like, oh, this lady's crazy. I would never do all of that. Um, it really does not take that long. So like I said, we're gonna go through this whole thing. Uh, we're gonna learn how to pull the flood maps. We're gonna learn how to pull the plats and the deeds. We're gonna, I'll show you where to find a nice AutoCAD drawing of a sketch of a house and how you can use that to when you're measuring for yourself. Show you where to find the septic and sewer permits, restrictive covenants, easements and plat maps, and then, and the road maintenance. Um, out of all of these things, uh, about two or three years ago, the Real Estate Commission made it a, a, re, a restrictive covenants a material fact. At that point, you would have noticed the residential property disclosure changed just a little bit, and it went from saying, does this house have restrictive covenants or an HOA or and an HOA to those being two separate um, check boxes because now restrictive covenants are very important to the real estate commission. So if you are not pulling restrictive covenants for every listing and buyer that you have, you really should be. This is something that they think is very important. And if they think it's important, it now becomes important to us, right? We want to keep our licenses. That's always a good thing. Okay. So, and so I'm going to go straight to Onzo County NC.gov and we're going to start learning how to pull all of these things. So this is the basic Onslow County website. It is a fantastic resource. If you have not played around in here, you definitely should. Um, if you've got clients that are moving here from somewhere else, give them this website address, onslowcountync.gov, because also in here, they have all the stuff for home health services, the library, mosquito control, all of the youth sports. Um, you know, just links to absolutely everything, including job opportunities, tourism, all of this. So um, this is a great resource for outside what we're talking about as well. So, you know, if you want to include that in any of your relocation packages or whatever, Onslow County has done a fantastic job with this website. Okay. So the, when I get an address, the first thing I usually do, you're going to be functioning over here on this left-hand side um, in most of it. We're going to talk first about GIS maps, and then we're going to go to e-services. E-services are where you're going to find the deeds and the restrictive covenants and the septic permits and all of that kind of stuff. But I like to start with the GIS maps, and I will show you why right now. So you just click on this. And again, this is all on that step-by-step. -step, so don't worry about taking copious notes. All of this will be on that sheet. The easiest way that I have found to start, and again, everybody has their ways of doing it. If you take a class from Onslow County, she will go over a million different ways to use all these little buttons and to use all this and everything else. But if in a general property search, if you know the address, this is a great place to start the search active layer bars. And so what we're doing up here if you just start typing in 628, uh, let's see, I don't know if there's a period in there or not. We'll go over this. Okay. So you just start typing in the address. You do need to put in the full address or it won't pop up what you're looking for. The reason why I chose this one first is, is this. So if you pull up an address and you get a pink background, this is your first trigger. Um, if we were talking in person, I would ask if anybody knows automatically what this pink is, but I will just go ahead and tell you because Zoom is weird and sometimes people kind of cut in and out, but this means that you are inside city limits of something. In this case, this is city of Jacksonville. You can see it says Jacksonville right here. So what that means to us is that these taxes are already higher, services are slightly different, 
but you also don't have to look for a septic permit most likely, right? <laughs> so there's a couple good things, couple bad things. But again, if your people are already at the top of their budget and they've been talking about county properties all along and they're at the top of their budget for being out in the county, you need to contact the lender right away and see if they qualify for that same price or a similar price in the city because there are higher taxes in the city of Jacksonville, okay? So the cool thing about starting with this page, and this is why I start with GIS and type in an address up here, is you get this bar along the bottom and it tells you so much information. If we toggle all the way over, it shows you a little bit of everything. Um, if you're looking uh, to contact somebody about a piece of land, it's gonna tell you what their current address is. It's going to tell you what the heated square feet is. Usually it's, uh, for some reason, Onslow County has stopped putting the acreage here. I don't know if that's a glitch or not. I've reached out to them to ask them, but usually the acreage is listed here as well. I'll show you where else to find it if it's not on here. Um, like the year it's built, total taxable income. So when we're, you know, this is something you put in the um, inflex. Uh, tells you what the subdivision name is, plat book and page, the last sale price, last sale date, so you know how long they've owned it. This is the deed book and page. This is the legal description, physical address, who the owner is, what the PIN number is. And all of these things, if you've ever put a listing in, you know that you need to know pretty much all of these things, and it is all right here. How fantastic. The other cool thing about this site right here is that it pulls in a lot of other things too. So with one click, you can go straight to the plat map. I am not, well, shoot, this bar is covering up what I wanna see here. Hold on one second. Um, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, hold on, I'm moving stuff around on my screen so I can actually get to places here. Okay, so, um, and we'll, we'll go do that in a second, but so you've got plats, you can jump straight to deeds. This view, uh, GIS deed card is a little mini deed search, and we're gonna click on all of these. We'll get back to them. I just want you to know how cool this is that Onslow County has incorporated all of these things. So if you'll notice on that sheet, why I said that you can pull everything in five to 10 minutes is half of the stuff we're pulling is right here, and it's just a click of a button once you're on there. But the first thing on our list is flood maps. So that is what we are going to push right now. So for that, you go up to map layers, click on map layers. I always click on dimensions because that is something that's in flex. They do need us to put these dimensions in here and this is a great place to get them. Little tip or trick just from flex or from regional MLS. If there's more than five, so this one has one, two, three, four, five dimensions. I would put all five of those in there, but as soon as you get more than five, you can put irregular in flex. You don't need to put like eight, you know, different dimensions in there. If it's a really weird shape, they, they, could, they know what irregular means. Little tip there for you. And then we come down a little bit. I always do check this wetlands approximation button. Why I do that is because if um, this is not the wetlands that we're, that I'm talking about when I say that you need to disclose that there's wetlands on a property, but this is a really good indication that there might be. So 404 wetlands are different. They show up on recorded plat maps that have wetlands annotated on them. Sometimes they show up on septic permits and plot plans, but they don't necessarily show up anywhere else unless you have a survey. And if you do have a survey done, you need to ask for those wetlands to be annotated specifically. But why I push this button to begin with is just to give me an idea that, you know what, that's something that I'm gonna wanna check because these wetlands here saying that this is a riverine swamp do touch the house. There might be wetlands on this property. I'm going to make sure with the plat maps and everything else, but I'll give you some examples of when you, you know, this becomes important. But this is just something that I check at the beginning just to kind of give myself an idea. But I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that because this isn't what we're looking for right now. Okay, so now you get down here. So all of the flood zones, I check a lot of these boxes. So I do do the historic and it'll tell you what it's looking for with all of these kind of things. So right now you can see that there's just this little bit of flood AE coming into the back of this, um, of this house. 
Now I've been to this house. I know, and this isn't even exactly where the house sits, but the house sits up here all the way next to here. So if you have this property and there's just flood on this little back portion right here, this person is not going to be required by a lender. If this were the case, if this is how it's going to stay, they would not be required to carry flood insurance. Now, if I saw, then this is Northeast Creek over here, if you couldn't tell where we were before. Um, if I saw all of this flood right behind my house, chances are I'm probably going to attempt to buy flood insurance, even though it's not required. If it's not required, it's probably not very expensive. But, you know, if there's that much, you know, pretty blue or red or anything real near the house that I'm planning on buying, I would probably consider telling my buyers to at least look into it. So Limwa is more of a coastal thing. But again, you want to get used to checking all of these boxes and the vast majority of things in Onslow County until you get to Topsail, Limwa, and Coastal A aren't going to come up on anything we're looking at. But if you get in the habit of clicking these buttons, you're not going to miss it the first time you do have a buyer that's down at Topsail. So like I said, these are just things that you want to get that muscle memory going of what you're always going to check for. It's always better to be clicking too many boxes than too few. Okay. So in general, everywhere in Onslow County, we got new flood maps in, on June 19th. So anywhere else in the county, I'm gonna click this button and those are gonna be my effective maps. So nothing happened here. If you also, if you didn't know this already, one of the exceptions to the new flood maps is city of Jacksonville. The city of Jacksonville did not approve the flood maps that were presented to them. So in that case, you need to click this preliminary button because look what just happened. So if this new, if the new flood maps do get approved by city of Jacksonville, all of this from here on is now flood zone. Okay, so we went from no floods, not anywhere really close to the house. And again, you know, if you've ever been to this house, the backyard goes to about here, and then it's a really steep drop off all the way down to this creek. The chances of the water coming all the way up there historically have been very, very small. But the city, you know, and, and, you know, all the scientists that have gotten together to show where these might actually go actually think that the flood map should look like this. Again, this one has not been approved, approved yet, but if this person was selling this house and I had a buyer looking at this, I'd want to make sure that they knew that it is possible that this flood zone is going to be real close to their house by the time all is said and done. Okay. So um, again, if you're in city of Jacksonville, you're going to want to make sure that you click this preliminary one still. You can go ahead and click both of those, even if you're in the county. Again, clicking more buttons isn't going to do you any harm. It just kind of grays out the rest of this if you click that preliminary one and you, you don't need it. Um, but again, it's not really hurting anything. And the last thing that I go and click on here is the aerial view. What that's going to do is it's going to show you where the house is. Okay, I know it's, I'm going to take the city thing off just so we can see this a little bit more clearly. So again, if this flood map became adopted, now this 0.2% flood zone does touch the house. Okay, and the flood AE is getting pretty close to the back of that house. So a lender is probably going to require some sort of flood insurance on this house at some point. Okay, so again, it doesn't matter to the people who own the house right now. They do not need to carry flood insurance as of today. They are not going to be charged extra for carrying flood insurance today. But again, if this house was on the market and I had the seller, you may want to, um, you know, talk to them about maybe getting flood insurance put in place right now because they're not going to pay a high um, price for that at the moment because it's not required. But those people come buying from them. Um, it is going to go up for them, okay? I'm gonna turn that city back on just so we don't get messed up later on and everything. But so these are the flood maps. And then when you go to print this for your people or whatever, you just go up here to the top, hit print, hit print, and it'll pop up a nice little screen. And if you wanted to put any of this stuff in here, so you had, um, a little legend at the bottom telling them what all these things are here. Let me go back and do that for you guys. 
So if you wanted them, if you wanted to make sure that they knew what these lines and all of that kind of meant, you can add as much as you want in here and it should put it at the bottom of this printout screen when it comes up. And then you can either save this as a PDF or physically print it if you want. Um, it didn't do it. Okay, well, usually it puts it down here. So yeah, they might be having some little glitches. Um, like I said, with that acreage, I've noticed that late, lately and everything too. So, um, but usually that'll come in. So that is pretty much the flood maps for, for something like this. Um, and this is one example I wanted to give you. Um, let's take a look at this one. So this is in Richlands. So when this house comes up, Um, hold on, I want to take out the, uh, let's get that gray to go away. Okay, this is why I wanted to do this. So this is Maidstone Park. And again, if you're not aware, Maidstone Park is in town of Richlands. They do pay taxes on top of the county taxes. So again, you may not be aware of that. Um, you know, you're, you, you don't even have to be new. I mean, that's kind of a, it's a weird thing that that Richlands and Holly Ridge and some of these do have some city limits and everything. So just make sure, like I said, the that city um, layer on here is a default for Onslow County GIS. So if you were to look up any address in here, it's already going to have that city thing on there. So you don't have to worry about putting that in. But it's a great thing to know at the very beginning, because again, their taxes are going to be just a little bit higher than they would be a mile down the street that's not in town of Richlands. Okay, so be aware of that for Richlands and be aware of that for Holly Ridge. Okay, again, really tiny portion of the, the county and the Holly Ridge and everything, but there is town of Holly Ridge and you need to kind of be looking out for that. So make sure you look for that pink. Um, so we talked briefly about um, topsoil. So I'll, let me show you kind of what some of that looks like. So there's the pretty beach. Okay. So this is when we were talking about, you know, the Limois and the coastal AEs and all of that kind of stuff. You're just going to see some different colors popping up in topsoil than you would other places. Let me scroll out a little bit so you can kind of see what some of those are. Um, but just again, be aware that you just want to make sure that you're clicking all of these zones and everything because you never know when all of a sudden it might become important that you have some of those on. Okay, so muscle memory, just make sure that you're kind of doing a little bit of everything for some of those just so you're not missing something. But again, if you were to pull this up and you didn't have some of those and you saw the ocean, that should probably clue you into, you know, let's make sure. And if you are not an expert on coastal area um, issues and all of that kind of stuff, that would be a great time to either refer that out or partner with somebody who is. Same thing with land, same thing with commercial, same thing with anything that you are not familiar with. Ask questions, make sure that you are really, you know, giving your people the, the best reasonable and prudent information that you can. Okay, we turned on that aerial view um, and I want to show you why that can be important, especially if, you, well, if you have the buyer or the seller, but in this case, um, so this is the house. Let me clear some of this away so you can see what's happening here. But so these lines, these red and green lines are GIS lines. It is a digital overlay. They are not exact. So if, if this is off by just a little bit off of a fence line, you, you know, you don't need to panic about that necessarily. But if you were to be, if you had a buyer for this house and you pulled this up and you saw that the house itself was hanging over this line and that that fence for this house is a good, you know, 10, 20 feet away from that property line. I am going to say that if you have already talked to your buyers about getting a survey and they've said, nah, I don't think I care about that. I don't think I want to pay that money. I don't think that's important. If you were to see something like this, you better convince them that it's important. You should probably be convincing them it's important anyway. <laughs> That's my two cents. But 
it, again, if, if you're pulling this information for them and you see something that's that far off, I don't know too many buyers who would say, oh, yeah, I don't think that's important. It, it's definitely important. Okay. So that's why we click that little aerial thing. And again, if you were in map layers, that's all the way at the bottom. And you just want to click that. And then this is on the sheet as well. You just want to make sure this toggle is all the way over to the right. That makes it easiest to see. This is a transparency gauge. So it just makes it um, the aerial just a little bit less transparent and everything. But it's a lot easier to see if you've got all that flood mapping going on and everything else, if you've got it all the way to the right. Again, that's my personal preference. You guys can do with that what you will. But that's why in, when you see the sheet, when I say make sure it's all the way to the right, that's what I'm talking about is this little little toggle thing there. Okay. So sorry, I didn't know if somebody was asking me a question. Um, it's I, I can't hear if it is. But I was going to say, if anybody has any questions about flood maps before we move on to the next one, um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask or just throw it up in the in the chat thing, let me know. Otherwise, we are going to move on to the next step. I'm sorry, my chat box is like disappearing. I don't know what's happening with my screen. So if somebody sees something, just holler it out to me, I guess. We'll, we'll forget about chat for now. <laughs> Okay, so hearing no objection. Oh, Amy, there Amy, yeah. Amy, there is one. It says the property line being over the line. What does that mean for the owner? Um, so if, if their neighbors have not asked them to move their fence by now, they're probably not going to. <laughs> um, what it does mean for the owner is that they, they should have probably figured that out before they bought the property. It can mean that now you as the buyer agent has, um, or, you know, that a buyer agent or a buyer has noticed this, they can ask the seller to move that fence as, um, you know, a condition of selling or, you know, I mean, I, I don't, if, if this were actually true, if this were the line, there's nothing you can do about that house. I probably wouldn't buy it. Um, if it was just the fence you best believe I'd be asking that seller to move the fence at their own expense before I bought the house. Um, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't buy the house with that being off that much, but let's say that this house sells next month or a year from now or whatever, and those people have a survey, you best believe that they're going to be asking you to move your fence and it is going to be at your own expense. So um, especially for buyers, you know, if you were to see something like this, you know, I would definitely be asking the seller to take care of it um, because it, you know, it is something that, you know, when you buy the house, you should buy it, you know, and with the conditions that you're comfortable with. Um, but if you're the seller and you happen to notice something like this, I'd go out and get a survey, make sure that that's correct. Um, and then I would, I, I mean, you know, I'm a rule follower. I would probably have it corrected because you you are you've got your stuff on a neighbor's property if a storm happened you know anything can happen with you know liability or you know anything like that where you know you really can get sued for some of this stuff to to move some of that if for some reason this was some sort of utility easement it could be a problem too so there's a lot of problematic things that could come up with this um but again, it's kind of like having an unpermitted shed. If you're the seller or if you're the owner of the house and you have an unpermitted shed, is anybody, is the county going to specifically reach out to you and, and tell you you have an unpermitted shed? Probably not. But when a buyer comes to buy it and they notice that it is, it, then it can become a problem. So, um, and we'll kind of get into some of that as well. But yeah, so that, that's mainly it. Like I said, what we're trying to do when we're pulling these things is just trying to head off any potential problems in the sale. And again, if you if this person had just asked you to list their house and you pulled this just to make sure, I'd have that conversation with them. Um, I'd be asking them if they had a survey, um, if they'd be willing to have a survey done, all of that, and let them know that there, there is a potential problem. But that's about as far as you can go if, if you've got the seller. How often does it happen that I this is super extreme, and this is why I have this as an example for this class. <laughs> you usually don't see something like this. Um, let me go back, because I think one of those other ones was off slightly. Let me see. 
Um, okay, hold on. Let me take the city thing off of here again. So like on this one, like this fence line, you can see right here is just a little off. If I were to pull something like that, that's what I probably wouldn't panic about immediately because this could very well be these lines being digitally put on top of, uh, you know, an aerial view just might be off themselves. But again, if I was this buyer and I saw something like that, especially because it's at a slightly different angle, I'm probably going to have a survey done because if these people put their fence up wrong, you want to make sure that they correct that before it becomes a problem for you. Does that make sense? Because this one at least looks like it's fairly parallel to this line, but that one's not. So the fact that it's not parallel would worry me more so than the fact that it overlaps just a little bit. Again, I'm a, I'm a big believer in surveys, period, uh, but it is up to the buyers. They can certainly waive having a survey done, but if you've given them this information and they've signed, and you, you, if you give them any of this information, if you send them this you know, if you print this off and you send this to them, you need to be having them initial this. <laughs> There's no sense in sending somebody something and not having them initial that they've seen it. Because um, if you have them initial and you can even drag and drop a text box from, you know, dot loop or DigiSign or whatever you use to say, I acknowledge that I see this issue and I have decided this is not a problem. You can be as pedantic as you want about it. You are covering your own tush at this point. But if you've sent this to them and they've initialed it, they have acknowledged that there could be a potential problem there. Um, you know, and then it's just how specific you want to get about it. Okay. All right. So I want to move on to, to the plat maps. And again, we're going to stay on this site. And so we're going to look at this house. And again, I'm going to keep all the flood maps up and all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to keep the aerial up. Again, this one is way off. Sometimes if you reset, like if you went out of GIS and came back in, it would kind of reset itself because sometimes it's, you know, the what you have it on. But again, if I saw that, I would, oops, sorry if I'm making everybody dizzy. Um, I, I definitely have a survey done on that house as well. So to find plat maps, and I'll tell you why plat maps are important and what you're looking for on them. But um, so the first thing is, if you just click on view plat maps, this one comes up right, right away, okay? Didn't give us any hassles, didn't give us an error message, any of that stuff. You come over here and you click on the image. Again, this is all on that sheet, so don't worry about me going too fast and you being like, oh, what'd she click on? It's all on there, I promise, okay? And this is a plat map, okay? Says it down here, revised final plat of Winchester Estates. These words are very important. Revised means that it's been revised at some point. So you probably want to figure out what the original one was. Final plat is very important, especially for any somewhat new neighborhoods. A lot of times there's a preliminary plat map drawn and it may not have all of the information on it. If it's a recorded final map, it should have pretty much everything. So what you're looking for on plat maps, there's a ton of information on this. So, you know, you've got all of these certificates. I know it looks like just a bunch of, uh, you know, crazy little stuff, but definitely read it, okay? It shows you who owns the land around it. It shows you all of the properties. It shows you legends and everything. It tells you, so this is a question in FLEX. This is one of the required fields in FLEX. What is that zoning? It's residential agriculture, RA, okay? tells you that right there. So you don't have to guess in flex. You don't have to do anything. It tells you right on the official recorded plat that that is RA, okay? It tells you the deed to this property. Um, it tells you what the setbacks are. So if people have questions for you on how far from the rear uh, fence would have to be, or, you know, again, in new construction, they may ask how close to, the, to here the house can be, 20 feet. You got those answers right there, okay? This property is not located in a flood hazard zone. Now, look right here, it's 11305, okay? Our flood maps have changed since that time. So going on this, this information can be outdated. So just, I wouldn't, you don't go by that for flood hazards, you go by the current information, okay? But this next one is important. It says that no wetlands are in this neighborhood. Just the fact that it says no wetlands means that they looked for them, okay? Because there are times when plat maps do not 
plat out wetlands. Okay, again, I'm going to say it again, if your people do have a survey done, they need to ask their surveyor to plot out the wetlands. If they don't, and I would put it in writing to them, if they do not ask specifically for wetlands, the surveyor is not going to mark the wetlands. Okay. All right, and then it's also going to go over, you know, who did the surveying if there. So this is why it was revised. They changed a couple street names and they changed some of the sign off agreements and everything. OK, so this may have not been Waverly way before. It may have been something else. All right. But uh, so, like I said, these are all pretty straightforward. Again, you find dimensions there if you need those for flex. This gives you the acreage, um, a whole bunch of information. So I want to go back, but that one was a really easy plat map to find. Um, I want to, sh oops, sorry, does this every once in a while. So here's another house. Again, at least these property lines look pretty good, but that fence is over a little bit. You want to check that out. But again, so we're going to click view plat. So now we got an error message. So this sheet goes over all of this as well. About 99% of the time, if you get an error message when you click on that to view plat, it's because of these leading zeros right here. Um, this site, the deed site doesn't like leading zeros. The GIS site throws them in there every once in a while. So 99% of the time, if you get this error message, all you need to do is go up here to book page and type in those numbers. It was 58, page seven. And as soon as you put those in, then it comes up just fine. Okay. Again, that's all on that sheet if something like that were to happen. Okay, so this is Sterling Farms. Again, lots of, of good information. Let me. Ah. Okay, I'm going to turn this so you can see it. Um, so again, this is a revised plat. They corrected the spelling of turquoise <laughs> at some point. Okay. Again, read all of these things because they can all become important. Okay, so this one says flood X, wetlands are as shown. This is a super important thing to be looking for on plat maps. All streets are intended for private use. Okay, the second you see that on a plat map, you need to call the lender. There are lenders who will not loan on private roads. Now, Sterling Farms isn't usually a problem because they have it in their covenants that the HOA maintains, okay? But there are subdivisions that are private roads that don't have an HOA or the HOA does not maintain or you cannot find anything in writing saying that who maintains it. If you run across that and you have a lender that does not lend on private roads, you need your buyers to switch lenders. There are lenders that will do it. But again, if you knew this information on day one, you're not gonna be scrambling two weeks before closing to find a new lender when the lenders finally figured this out. This is why this, all of these things are important to find first, okay? So, and then as we go to page two, this is what wetlands look like on, mm, I would say most plat maps. To me, they look kind of like chicken feet, okay? There is one surveyor in town that makes them look like a, uh, a middle school girl's clouds, like the little, yeah, big puffy clouds. Don't know why, um, but the vast majority of the time you're gonna see what looks like little chicken feet and it will be labeled wetlands. Sometimes it's just an arrow saying it's wetlands, but they are wetlands. So let me back up just a little bit and say why this is important. So, and we get a lot of wetlands in our area. These are, these are 404 wetlands. They are designated a, um, a federal preservation area by the Army Corps of Engineers. If you have any questions about wetlands and all of that, you can contact the Army Corps of Engineers and ask them questions. They will answer those. Wetlands become important. So just hearing the word wetlands, I know most buyers and probably some agents think, ooh, that sounds swampy. It's not necessarily. Uh, wetlands are there to hold back floodwater sometimes. They're, they are a barrier area. They are protected though. And that is very important. The words 404 protected wetlands all go together. 
your buyers, if this, so let's say your buyers are buying lot 434 right here and they wanted to put a shed here on a concrete platform, they cannot, or at least you have to tell them they cannot. Whether the Army Corps of Engineers or FEMA or anybody else is ever going to come after a private buyer, we cannot promise. But it is your job as their realtor to know enough to tell them that if they do that, it could be a fine in the $40,000 range. These are federally protected wetlands. Also, if this is new construction and there is new construction going on in Sterling Farms, if this was new construction and you asked the builder to do something in this area, that, that one's not great. Let's take a look at... Well, let's say that this was actually a sellable lot for some reason, which it wouldn't be. But um, well, even here, if these people on 399 wanted to move their house back and have it sitting, you know, dead center, the builder cannot do that. They absolutely can't touch these. They will have the black tar paper up on rebar and they have to leave it there until construction of that section is complete. Um, again, once it is a private buyer, you kind of you know, have a, a little bit less oversight probably than the builders do, but, but FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers are watching the builders to make sure that no building runoff and everything gets into these wetlands that's going to disturb them. So that's why those black silt fences are up. So if you ask a builder to remove that and they tell you no, I promise you it's not because they're being lazy, uh, they cannot, okay? But what the wetlands do and, and what they're always going to tell you is you can walk through wetlands. You can do a lot back there. Um, you just don't want to disturb the ground cover. It's there for a reason. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's holding back something worse, like floods or whatever. Sometimes it's, it's because they need that ecological boundary for some reason. It's not for us to question why. It's just for us to tell people, no, you can't build there. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. There are fencing companies that can put fences over wetlands or, or will. Um, they usually just maybe have to leave like a little bit of um, uh, a little raised area so that they're not disrupting that wetlands and, and water can still flow back and forth and dirt can still flow back and forth and all of that. But that is up to the fencing company and sometimes the HOA and everything else. So again, if I were to buy this house, I'd probably put my fence along the wetlands line and not deal with that. But again, it's your job to give the buyers as much information as you can. Um, but if you do see wetlands, just tell them not to touch it. That's pretty much what it is. The nice part about wetlands is that they can they might not be able to touch it, but neither can no, can anybody else. So they're always going to have this beautiful tree line. They're never going to see into these people's backyard, you know. So there are definitely benefits to having wetlands. It's not a bad thing. It's not a stigma. It's none of that. They can be wonderful. You get that beautiful tree line. I've got a bunch in my backyard, and I absolutely love them. But it does depend on the person because again, if your buyers have said the words. I need a 20 by 20 outbuilding for the three cars that I'm redoing. This is probably not the lot for them because the house is going to go here. And if they could fit a 20 by 20 here, great, but it's, it's doubtful. So if they had the option of choosing this lot or this lot for some reason, they're probably going to want to choose this lot. And again, if you had not pulled this map, you wouldn't be giving them all of the information. So anytime that your client says, it's important to me, or I need to do this, or I want to do this, these are the things you're looking for. Because this tree line may be fantastic for, you know, uh, most of the people you, you work with, but for those people that really need, you know, they want that big green ground pool, they need a playground, they need all that stuff, this, this is not the lot for them. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to give a couple more examples. So let's see. I don't know if this one has changed yet. Oops, can't spell. Okay, so again, we have a leading zero here. So it's given us this error message. So we go up to book page, type it in and it comes up all nicely. And this is what we're looking for on this one. I just wanted to pull it up to show final. Um, they did have some corrections and all of that kind of stuff. So this is the final one. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like when you, um, 
you know, it, okay, sorry. There is a helicopter going over and it is super loud right now. Uh, okay, so let me show you why it may be important that there's old plats and new plats and all of that kind of stuff. So on this one, the map that pulls up automatically, which sometimes if you only see a couple, that, that's a little bit of an indication that it's not showing you the whole neighborhood, but some neighborhoods are only four or five houses, so it might be that. But right here, it says a recombination of lots 43, 44, 45, and 46. So this plat map is only the recombination of these lots. Well, great. So it's giving you the correct information. It is now telling you exactly what these dimensions are truly because they may not have been in the first map or anything like that. Um, but if you were to see something like that, you would probably want to go back and look for that original one. And usually you're going to have something like this that says reference. And so it's telling you that the original one, this is a recombination plat, the original plat map was 26167. Okay. So again, we're going to want to go to book page and type in 26, page 167. And when we do that, we get this plat map, which is the whole neighborhood. Fantastic. So we were looking at 45, 46, 47, all of these over here. Okay. So this was the recombination. Does anybody see what the problem is now? There were wetlands on the back of this that didn't get on to that final recombination plat because they didn't need to, you know. Um, so again, it's just one of those things that you want to make sure that if you see something referenced somewhere else, go ahead and back up that step. Because again, if your person was buying this lot and they needed a whole bunch of stuff and you're like, oh yeah, this new plat looks great. You know, there's, there's no wetlands on here. And then you get to here and there are, again, just take the time if you see that it's a recombination or revised or anything like that to just take um, a step back and, and look for that again. I'm sorry, it's really, I can't hear. It was just kind of cutting in and out when you were talking. Um, it was, where did you see that it was revised at? Okay, so that was the original plat map. And just the fact that it said it's a recombination. And when you're looking at it, like if you knew Riverside Plantation, you know this isn't the whole neighborhood. It really is only four lots of the neighborhood. So I'd want to see the big plat anyway. But anytime you see something that says, you know, recombination, um, revised, anything like that, just look for that reference number and just take a second to go back and type in those books and pages um, to just see if there's anything important. A lot of times there's not. Most of the time this would have gotten put in there as well. It just wasn't what they were looking at at the time. Um, and there is nothing on here saying that they specifically look for wetlands in there. A lot of times you can read some of that and it'll tell you if they look for wetlands. But this really was just to recombine these lots and that's all they were doing. They were just looking for these dimensions for this one. They weren't looking for the other stuff. All right. So my last example for plat maps, this is where, if you will remember back to when I told you when we were in these up here. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of flood on here, but again, the house is all the way up here. These people are not required to have flood insurance. They're not gonna be required by a lender. If this was my house, again, I would probably go ahead and buy flood insurance. If I was their agent, I would probably at least ask, you know, tell them, hey, go ahead and get a quote. I promise it won't be very much. But they are not required to have flood insurance because it does not touch the house or any attached outbuildings um, attached to the house. So I'm going to take these the floods off of here because it's um, blocking what I'm what I'm trying to show you guys. Hold on, it's thinking about it. Okay. 
So back at the very beginning, when I said, I usually come in here and where'd it go? And click this wetlands button. This is exactly the reason why. Okay. So if I had done that and I was coming through here and I'm like, ooh, that's a big swath of wetlands or a big swath of depressional swamp forest. Usually, if you see depressional swamp forest in that green, it's a real good indication that there might be some 404 wetlands. But take a look at this aerial map. Okay. So just kind of. Think about what you're seeing here with, with this tree line and, and with this. But then we go, being the, the good agents that we are, and we hit this. I don't know why this one's not coming up. We'll go ahead and just type in. And there it is. So again, sometimes there's just weird little glitches. Just type the numbers in. OK, so this one is lot 35 is what we're looking for, OK? So here's lot 35. Ah, oh, there's there's no wetlands in here. Cool. Okay, so it's just depressional swamp forest, and that doesn't really mean anything to us. These people could clear this whole backyard and you know do whatever they want. They could have an in-ground pool and a giant like party shed out here. Great, that's what they want. Um, but again, you keep getting drawn back, and you're like, man. But that's pretty clear cut, even without. So let's let's take off that thing, that layer, and then go out a little bit. This is an older neighborhood. They're not old, old, but it's older. It's not new construction, and not one of these neighbors have cut down any trees. Not one of these neighbors. Have, that's regal wood, man. Not one of these people have cut down trees, huh? Okay, if you see something like that and you do not see wetlands on here, you better start reading all this fine print and everything because I guarantee you that they did not mark wetlands on here because those are. And we had, a, and this was one of the houses that we, we had a buyer on this and we had a survey done and sure enough, that wetlands hit right about here. Okay, so these are the things you're looking out for. But if you went into all of these and you read all of these, not one place on this plat map does it say that they looked for wetlands. And then there's this over here too. August 14th, 1985. Okay, so back in the 80s, they did not put wetlands on plat maps. Okay, so these are all the things as a reasonable and prudent agent that you need to keep in the back of your head. The same things that are common now were not common in the 80s. If you've seen the plat maps and everything from like the 1930s and 40s, you know, there's there's almost nothing on there. As our country and everything else has gotten a little bit more litigious, everything becomes a little bit more important. But again, if you had a client who had said the words, oh, I love this lot, and yeah, I want to put this, 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 and this on here. If all you saw was this and you were just going by rote and saying, yeah, cool, 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 um, this one looks good. There's no wetlands on this plat map. Well, plat map isn't the be all and you know, end all of everything. If you had seen that none of these people had cut down trees and this, and they were still insisting that they wanted all of these things, those people need to have a survey done and they need to ask for the wetlands to be plotted on there in writing, um, okay? But once you've done all of this and you've sent this off to them and you say, hey, I know it's not on that plat map, but I deeply believe that there could be wetlands on this property, you've done your job. There's only so much that we can do. You are not an expert in every field, but would a reasonable and prudent agent who's you know, played around in public records enough to know what the warning signs are, should you have told your people that this could be wetlands? I, I believe so, um, okay? So, but if you ever come up with anything like that and you have questions, definitely ask people in your office and, and all of that, okay? Like I said, plat maps are a super cool tool. I use them a lot. Um, there's a lot of good stuff on them, um, but they are not infallible um, more because sometimes the information just wasn't important to the people who were doing them, okay? Does anybody have any questions on plats before we move on to deeds? Uh, 
There's nothing in the chat. Cool. Okay. So once again, we're still on GIS. So let's say we're looking at the same house over and over. We did the flood maps and then we checked the plat map and now deeds is right next to it too. Okay. So when we go and actually, uh, this one's changed hands since the last time I looked. So let me go. We're going to jump ahead really quick to this GIS deed card, and I'll tell you what's kind of cool about this. This is just a, it, that button is just a cool little mini deed title search type thing. So if you, so it's going to give you the most recent deed, and then it's going to go back to past deeds. So rather than having to copy down, because on here it's going to say what deed this is replacing in the writing, and you'd have to type all that in, but with this one button, it, shows all this. So what I wanted to show you on this is why it's, there's a bunch of reasons why it's important to pull the deed. This is one of them. Let me expand this a little bit. Okay. Uh, oh, that's the grand tour. So we need to go back one more. Sorry, we're getting there. Okay. So the husband's name is spelled E-I-L-E-R-T-S-O-N. E I L E R S T O N. So if my people were buying from these people, one of their names is spelled wrong. I don't know which one yet, but one of the spouse's names is spelled wrong. Okay. So that's one of the things you're looking for. If you've got a buyer, and even and if you've got the seller, if you've got the seller, so let's say the Eilertsons are selling their house, they've asked you to be their listing agent. It is best practice, I believe, and I think many attorneys would probably believe, to have this be how their names read on the, the listing agreement, on the contract that's going to come in, all the seller stuff, because that's already how this house was deeded to them. It's just much easier if you keep it consistent. So make this one John T and her Jennifer with no middle name. If they want it to be something different, you know, go with God on that one. But um, like I said, this is a really good way to, to do that. And please put this in flex. When it asks for the owner's name, write out John T period and Jennifer Eiler, and then know how to spell their last name You know, <laughs> when you do that. But that's one of the things we're looking for on deeds is, um, is how their names are spelled, how their names are on there, all of that kind of stuff, okay? So that's one. And we'll go back to that little mini deed search or title search because that's pretty cool. Um, but let's take a look at and again, all these houses have changed hands again since the last time I need to update my list. All right, so let's go back one. Okay, so if we're looking at um, if we're looking at a deed, okay, uh, hold on. we're going to go back one more. I promise I'll get there. Okay. So this is, let's say that I have the buyer and this is the deed that comes up right here. So I push the button. This is the deed that comes up and it says Nicholas and Kelly Keith, but I'm looking in flex. And the listing agent has put Nicholas and Heather Keith. Okay, well, I don't particularly think that the listing agent misspelled Kelly or Heather with Kelly. Maybe she was confused, I don't know, but I probably need to ask. So I'm looking at that, what I'm coming up with on the deed and I'm looking at Flex and they're wrong. So I asked the listing agent and she's like, oh no, Nicholas and Kelly got divorced He's now married to Heather. And I'm sure you remember this from pre-licensing, but if that were to happen and there is no, um, there's no free trader agreement, there's no, you know, it could possibly be that all three of these people, Nicholas, Kelly, and Heather, now all have to sign every bit of paperwork. And none of us want that. None of us want the new wife and the ex-wife to have to sign anything. Okay. So what I would need to tell the listing agent to do is, hey, is there a quit claim? Is there a free trader agreement in their divorce decree? Is there anything? Death certificate. Did, did, did Kelly pass? You know, what's, 
the situation and how do we get her off of there so that she does not have to sign. And again, you want to know this at the beginning of the transaction, not two days before closing. Okay, so you've got that. So what they ended up doing was a quick claim deed. So Kelly quick claimed the house to Nicholas before it closed so that we didn't have to deal with that. Okay, and now Nicholas and his new wife, Heather, were going to, now they own the house. And so they're the ones that need to sign all the paperwork to the new buyers. Does that make sense? So these are all things like, you, like I said, the first time that you pull the deed up and you see anything like a name misspelled or, you know, different names than what is in flex, you need to start asking the listing agent questions immediately because you couldn't fill out an offer correctly if, if you're coming up with conflicting information. Okay. This one's changed hands too. So, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that you're looking for on deeds. Let me blow this one up. Okay, so the first one, one of the cool things it shows you is you can figure out how much they paid for the house. If you can't see any kind of deed or whatever, you just take the tax stamps and, and multiply. If you don't know how to do that, ask your pre licensing teacher. <laughs> Um, so then you're looking for all of this. Is this the correct lot? Is this what you think you're buying? Are these the names that are on there? Great. Bunch of legal mumbo jumbo most of the time. But again, is that the correct lot? Uh-oh. Subject to reservation of mineral rights. Okay. So we all fill out that MOG disclosure. And we've done that for the past, I don't know, eight, nine years. Uh, because it became a problem. So there was an entire neighborhood that was sold uh, that the mineral rights had been rescinded from and the listing agent nor the closing attorney who closed all of those knew or disclosed it or whatever. Now, if you sit in a closing with Keith Fisher, he will tell you all day long that there is nothing to drill for in North Carolina. We can't drill in a neighborhood anyway, but let's say that this isn't in a neighborhood. Okay, if the seller or a past owner has reserved the mineral rights, that means that they own the mineral rights. That means that these people here and anybody that they sell to are selling without the mineral rights. So if we were in Texas or somewhere where there was oil or diamonds or, or something cool, those old owners who have the mineral rights have the mineral rights. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can come dig for them, but it does mean that if it was found while your buyer owned the property, they don't have any rights to them either, okay? So this can come up. And if you see this come up on the thing, you're going to want to see if the attorney can get it bounced back where whoever did reserve those mineral rights will go ahead and you know waive their their reservation because it, you know in theory what we would love is for when your people are buying the property that they own the air rights and the mineral rights and all of that kind of stuff more importantly possibly in our area would be if this said reservation of timber rights okay and i have tried for years to find a, an example of this and i haven't found one if anybody does have a deed that says that it's subject to timber rights and you would send me those page numbers i would really appreciate it because i would love to add it to this class but where that could become important is, again, if the owner keeps the timber rights and your buyer now owns the, you know, they close, they own the land, um, it doesn't mean that that seller can come cut trees down on their property necessarily. But it does also mean that your buyer cannot cut down trees on that property if they don't own the timber rights. So again, you're looking for these things that are showing what the buyer is actually buying, what the seller is actually selling. Are they selling everything to do with this? Are they, are they reserving anything? So again, the deeds become very important. Okay. And again, just kind of go through and get used to, to reading all of these. You do want to read. So, you know, all of that, cool. And this, this page can be important. Yeah, especially if you've got people that are buying at the courthouse steps, if they're looking for deeds, you always want to see this top box checked 
that there's no um, delinquent taxes or anything from Onslow County, you know, because this is a lien right here. Okay. So usually that last page is attached there, and that's always a good thing to just check and make sure if it's, um, you know, if it's if it's in the MLS and stuff. Chances are that isn't there, but it's always, always, always a good thing to check. Okay. So then the other thing that's in some of these, and we click on deeds, it comes up. Is everybody noticing that the deeds are coming up a lot easier than the plat maps? We don't have all those weird leading zeros. Okay. So again, Checking, checking, all of this. That's how their name's spelled. Perfect, perfect. It's correct there. Okay. Project, oh my goodness. Property is subject to restrictive covenants. And they give you books and pages. Start noting those down. Okay. Now, this doesn't mean that these are the only restrictive covenants that belong in this neighborhood. There very well may could be more that have recorded since this deed was recorded, or the attorney could have missed something or whatever. So this isn't a be all and end all again. You don't want to take second or third hand information and pass it on as gospel truth. You want to do the research yourself. But this is an excellent indication that you need to look for restrictive covenants. Also an excellent indication is that this is a builder and this is new construction and there is probably restrictive covenants in this neighborhood. But um, like I said, that, that's a really good indication that those are a great place to start. So I usually just note down the book and page numbers. And again, you could go right back here. Um, let me see, 3645820. You could do that straight from here. And there you go. And it's pulling up a whole bunch of stuff. So all of these are attached probably too, but that's a good place to start. Anytime you see 29 pages, those are probably the original ones. And then this restrictive covenant, the next one, supplemental for phase two, that's an amendment, okay? And we'll go over all of this when we get to, to all of that. But I just wanted you guys to kind of see that that's a good place to start um, to know that there are restrictive covenants. And do be aware that it is not just... Or, it is not just new communities that have restrictive covenants. They've been around a long time. So Winter Road off of Gum Branch in Rain Tree, subject to restrictive covenants. Okay. So just make sure. And that's kind of, I don't know if this is an old one. So 1319, 722. Okay, we'll get to that when we talk about restrictive covenants. But um, but do be aware that you're looking for that in all of in all deeds, not just on, on new, new homes. But like I said, um, so that's really cool. We've done this. We've looked at plats. We've looked at deeds. This view at GIS deed card is super cool. Anytime you click on that, that's your little mini title search. If you needed to go back a couple deeds, they pulled all of this together for you. It's just a really kind of cool tool that they give you. It doesn't give you the whole deed. It just gives you page one, but you'd have the book and page number up here at on the top and you'd be able to look up the book and page numbers because this one's three pages long, but it's only going to give you the first page. Okay. It's just a little snapshot, snapchat, my goodness, snapshot of what you should be looking for. All right. So that's it on deeds. Like I said, just get used to reading through those deeds um, and you'll see what's important and what's not. The last thing that I want to show you kind of on this little line, if you click on view property card, it gives you a ton of information. So like I said, on this, if we came over here, Oh, this one actually is showing the legal acres on there. So that's great. If it didn't, chances are it probably would on here. So the profile of this gives you kind of the basic information. Again, when you're inputting things into Flex, if you don't know what kind of, you know, heating system it has, it's going to be in here. This one's electric. OK, and you can use this. Now, if you're if your buyers have said, oh, I changed this to a geothermal system. Okay, well, yes, use their information. But if you don't know, um, information in, in public records for that should be should be accurate enough. What is not accurate in county records is probably this number right here, the heated square footage. And we can go over this a million times. We can teach a million classes on measuring your houses, but please measure your own houses. This number is probably wrong. I, what does everybody think? 
90% of the time. I mean, it, it's a lot. It, it, it's probably not correct. Uh, it's a good place. Like if you're, if you're doing a CMA and you've never seen the house or whatever, it's a fine place to start. Just measure the house yourself though, please. Um, again, if you're working on CMAs and you want to throw a picture on there and you don't have time to drive past the house, there's always going to be a picture up here and you can use that for your CMAs. This is taken by, um, you know, a county tax assessor, not another real estate agent or whatever, and it would be just fine to throw on a CMA. I would not use that as a flex photo or anything like that, but if you just need something real quick, or if you do foreclosures or somebody's asked you to do a CMA and they didn't give you a whole lot of information, you now know that this is a two-story home with a two-car garage. Cool. You've got information with a covered front porch. So you get a little bit of information. Um, what I wanted to show you though, is this sketch. So again, we may not want to go with what they say the heated square footage is, but what I love is this right here. So I'm an engineer by trade. Again, if you don't know me, I am a huge nerd. I love AutoCAD, but I love this for a couple different reasons. You can click over here on printable version and take this with you when you go measure the house. Like I said, I wouldn't turn this in as my measurements, um, but what I would do is print that out Take it with me because if this said it was like 20, 2,082 heated square feet or whatever, if I get out there and I measure and this is 31 feet and this is 10 feet, well, I've already proved why my numbers are different than the county numbers. Does that make sense? So I would just cross out this number and put whatever my number is over here in my writing and keep going. But because it's a two-story house, you also have to measure the upstairs. And this is kind of where the county records fall through is they measure the downstairs and then just double it for the upstairs. But we all know that some houses, you know, don't have um, rooms above the garage or something like that. So it's not necessarily correct that they just double it. This is why we measure. But like I said, I do love this AutoCAD drawing. I do use this. I do print it out and I do take it with me because now it's already drawn and sketched out for me. But if I get to the house and there's a whole nother area over here that's not on here, I know that the Onslow County Tax Assessor has not given value for this. And that could trigger two different things. First of all, it could be a new addition that they don't know about. So that's why my heated square footage would be different. Second of all, if they're not counting it, it may not be permitted. So also just you know, check into that and we'll get into permitting in just a second as well. But like I said, I do like this sketch and that is straight from this page as well. Just click on view property card. Sketch was one of the things over there and there is a nice printable version. So those are cool for that and that only. <laughs> it does help you see the basic layout of the house though. Okay, so this is all we're doing on this particular GIS page. So this is a great place to start. Like I said, all we did was type in this the address up here and we got to the plats, we got to the flood maps, we got to the deeds, we got to sketches, all kinds of stuff, okay? And like I said, a lot of that information that you need to even get stuff into Flex, all right? So now we're gonna go back to the Onslow County NC.gov main page. Everything else we're doing is under this e-services. We were under GIS maps before, now we're coming down to e-services. The first thing I want to show you are where to find the septic permits, and that is in here. So we clicked on e-services, and now you've got all these things down here. We're going to play around in the deed books, which you guys have all, we've already seen because that's where we were when we were typing in book and page numbers for plats and deeds, but this is a link directly to that site. Um, but this is search permits and plans. This takes a while to load. So if you are in a hurry and you're going to get frustrated, this is the site that's going to do it to you. You're watching how slow it loads. Now, I will say that my Mac loads this a lot faster, but it is still slow. Um, so I've got a lot of things to like look up in, in here, but we may not get to all of them if it's gonna go this slow all day because I don't want you guys to be here until nine o'clock tonight. But once this pops up, and like I said, this looks really a lot like Pender Ports does, um, but we're gonna click on search public records. Again, this will be on the sheet that you get. And again, we wait. Um, you can pull sewer permits off of here. You can pull all kinds of stuff. Um, mostly what you guys are probably gonna be looking for on resales are septic permits. So once you get to here, and again, all of this is on that page, 
we're going to type in the address and leave off street drive all of that kind of stuff it just needs the uh, street number and street name to pull these okay so once that comes up you'll get all of these things so these are all five of the results that were found for this one house so you've got an improvement permit residential gas and fuel operation permit and construction authorization so the way that it happens, and if you've ever done new construction, you get one of these at a time. So the first thing that you get when a house is first being permitted is this improvement permit. It's the first version of the septic permit. And then you get the construction authorization, and then you get the operations permit, and then finally you get like the building permits and all of that kind of stuff. So, but what you're looking for, you could dig into all of these, but the most recent one, this one is going to have all of these attached in there too. So there's no reason to go through all of these um, because you're gonna get all of that information in the most recent and you can see that with these issued dates, okay? So this issue, this is 123, this is March, this is February, and, but this is February 14th. This is the most recent. If you see anything that has this residential build or BLD, the, this is the one that you wanna click on. The only, Exception to that is this right here. This is a gas fuel line. So this is a completely separate record. Um, so if you wanted to show that the gas lines had a permit, you could definitely click on that. We're not going to do that today. But like I said, these are all really cool to click on. But once you get into the residential building permit section, and again, we're waiting, it's going to pull up everything that has been uploaded into Onslow County permitting. So Pender, if you were in Pender port looking at this, it will show pretty much the same screen, but we're gonna go here when this thing starts stops thinking, we're gonna, we're gonna click on attachments and all these attachments are gonna come up in Onslow County. They do not come up, hopefully just yet in Pender. I'm hoping that they are just uploading these now and that they just haven't been uploaded yet. But once that stops thinking up here, you now have access to all of this. There's a trust repair letter. There's the termite slip. So this is the, um, when we do WDIRs and everything, this is saying that this house has been pre-treated for termites. This is the septic permit. This is the CO, certificate of occupancy. This is showing that the house is ready to be moved into. This is a lot of times the last thing that you're waiting for on new construction. You can find it here sometimes before the attorney can. So know where to look for that. Certificate of Compliance comes right before that. This is the plot plan, the engineering letter, the approved floor plans, and the application permit, okay? All of these things are fantastic for you to have. If I had the buyer on this house, you best believe, oops, I would be clicking on every single one of these and I would be having them initial every single one of these because it is public information. These are public records and I have seen them. So why wouldn't my client see them? Okay, makes sense. But right now we're gonna take a look at the septic permit because that's kind of what we're talking about. So again, I, I mentioned all those words of the improvement permit, the construction authorization. So you can see this one came first, then this one was attached and they kind of, they don't necessarily go in that order. There'll be some sort of preliminary plot plan showing where the septic, and you know the people who did the septic where they think all of this is going. This is not necessarily a final plot plot plan, but if this is all you have and your people are kind of wondering where the septic is going to go and where the house is going to sit and how long the driveway is going to be, this is a very good first indication. This is what they are hoping for. This is what they filled out the permit application for. Again, we're seeing right here, it's, I know it's upside down, but it says four bedroom residence, okay? So this is what they're trying for with the septic lines going here and the repair area right behind it, okay? So we're going to go back up to the top though and look at that. And so when you read through a, a septic permit, make sure that that's the right address, lot number, whatever you know. This is the majority of what you're looking for as a buyer's agent most of the time. Four bedroom, okay? So this is a four bedroom house. If it's listed in the MLS as a five bedroom, that agent is incorrect and you should tell them. You tell them nicely, email them, call them, whatever. Do not report them first, you know, 
be, be a good agent and it could be a good co-broke and let them know because um, some people just don't know. But what this does mean, and we went over this a little bit before, if this is a four bedroom home, this means that eight people can live in this house and not be considered a health hazard. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they're babies, full grown adults, anything like that, eight people can live in this house. So if there's nine, if it's nine person family, this is not the house for them. Um, but that's one of the things you're looking for. And then you start looking at the system information. Again, you do not need to be an expert on septic systems to know that if this is like four lines long, describing what kind of system this is, it's probably a fairly expensive system to replace. And maybe you should call us a septic um, person and ask them their opinion on this type of septic system. <laughs> because and let's go over a little bit what some of these things mean. So this, these are the septic lines. This is where the septic system is. So if these people wanted to have a pool, they cannot put the pool on top of septic lines. They cannot drive on top of septic lines. If they have a boat, a heavy, heavy boat that they are gonna wanna store in their backyard, they are gonna wanna go this way with the boat. They're not gonna wanna come over here and drive and park behind here and drive over this line right here, okay? So these are all things that you can just be telling them, but this is where the septic's gonna go. If this septic or any of these lines within the septic were to fail, repair area means that this is where they plan to move it, the lines. It has also perked. It would also be acceptable for a septic area. So if anything fails in here, they're gonna move it here. Sometimes the repair area is not right next to the septic area. Sometimes it's a completely different area of the house, of the yard. What you need to be telling your people, if, again, if these people have said, I have to have an in-ground pool. Cool, cool, cool. Great. You can put it here. You can put it here. You can put it here. You cannot put it here. Now, officially, could they put it here right now? Yes, there's nothing underneath it. But if anything fails in there and this has to move, they're going to have to dig out that in-ground pool. Okay, your job is to tell them that they cannot build anything permanent on top of this repair area. And they probably should not have like an above ground pool super duper close to the septic lines. If you've ever lived on septic, you'll know why you really just don't want that area oversaturated or any real weight um, being put anywhere real, real close to it. They're not that fragile most of the time, but it's just a better idea to just leave that area alone for anything that might be heavy. Okay. So that's what you're looking for on septics for the most part. The plot plan can also give you ideas. So what I had told you before is um, sometimes if you don't see wetlands, they will show up on plot plans a lot of times too. So if there were wetlands on the back of there, you'd probably see wetlands lines on a newer plot plan too. Okay, so this is what it actually looks like. So if we went back to that septic permit, it wasn't drawn quite this nicely and it looked like it was a little bit closer to the house. Um, now we know that these septic lines are a little bit back further. So again, if they wanted that pool, they actually do have room between the house and the septic area if they wanted to put the pool there or an outbuilding or anything like that. Okay, so the plot plan is what you'd want to go by with that because these are the actual lines of where that's going. It's also going to show you those minimum setbacks and all of that kind of stuff, show you driveways, uh, patio areas, built upon areas. Again, if you are in an area, well, any, any area, you can't concrete an entire lot that just, it doesn't work that way there. You can only have um, 3,516 square feet built upon in this entire lot. Okay, so sometimes if you're going to like a, a homeowners association and asking them if you can extend your patio, they're going to ask you what the BUA is, or they're going to ask your clients if they ever ask you that. This is a great place to find it. it is a plot plan. Okay. Oh, oh no, did I just? Okay, cool. All right, so that's one. Um, so this has become a big deal lately. But he knows where I'm going with this one. All right, so offsite septic systems have always been a thing. Offsite septic systems have always been a little bit different. But now, if you have a buyer using a VA loan and you were to 
Okay, so again, sorry, I'm gonna interrupt myself, but we've got operation permit. Hey, they had an in-house daycare. That's great. They actually got it for a foster care. They got it permitted for that. Um, this is that residential building permit. That's the one we wanna click on. Um, but if, if you were going through and your people needed to close in two weeks or they were gonna be homeless, and again, you're doing your job by pulling all of this stuff and they're in between choosing two houses and you're pulling all the public records and you're seeing if it's in flood zones and you're doing everything that you know you should be doing or that I think you should be doing, <laughs> not really the same quite thing. And then you happen to get to the point, oh, still thinking, give me a second. And on some of these, sometimes you just have to either read the notes of what they might be or whatever, or just click on all of them to, to get it. Um, you also wanna make sure you're looking at the most recent one. So this was the construction authorization and plot plan that was done in October, but this one has the construction authorization and plot plan, and this one was done in December. So I'm gonna wanna look at the most recent one because they obviously changed something. But like I said, I'm an agent going through this and I'm reading and I see these words right here. Offsite. And then I look at it and I see that, you know, let's say that this is the lot and their septic systems are offsite all the way over here. The second you see the word offsite, you better, and your people are VA particularly, um, but it can happen with other kinds of loans too. The VA is clamping down on offsite septic permit. And if your people have an offsite septic system, it, you have to get together a whole slew of information proving that that buyer has deeded access to not only their lot, but to the septic area, the offsite septic area, that they have full access in, pepper, in perpetuity, um, that there are no restrictions for that, who maintains it, all kinds of stuff. The VA has this whole thing, and we did a class on this not too long ago. Go back and watch that if you have questions on this. I'm not going to go too much more into it, but it, it has to be, all of that paperwork has to be approved by a VA attorney. It is required before the appraiser can even go out to do an appraisal. So again, if you have a VA buyer who's on a time crunch, this is probably not the house for them because it's going to take at least three weeks to even get the VA approval. And that's if you have all the correct paperwork. If you don't, you may be going to attorneys to have them re-record covenants, to have them record new deeds, to have all kinds of stuff done. So again, if your people are in a time crunch and it is an offsite system and the seller has not already started compiling all this information for you, probably not the house for them because it's going to be at least three weeks before the appraisal, the appraiser can even go out. Okay. Um, and again, with offsite, the other issue with it, if your people are getting a survey done and it's an offsite septic system, they're going to have to pay for the survey of their lot. And they also have to pay to have the offsite septic area surveyed. It's not like it's necessarily double, but it is going to be just a little bit more expensive. Um, definitely talk to your surveyor about that when you call around or have the buyers do that. Um, those are just some of the things to know about offsite. So again, if you're looking at this at the very beginning of a transaction and you can head off that problem, or just know that you need to start getting your ducks in a row, I'd probably be on the phone with the listing agent immediately saying, hey, did you know this is offsite? Have you already started compiling all the paperwork that we're gonna need to get over to the attorney? If they have no idea what you're talking about, you need to start scrambling. <laughs> all right, so that is offsite. Um, and again, if you're looking at stuff and um, you, know, you see things that say like, PEAT system, P-E-A-T, or, you know, all kinds of crazy paragraphs on uh, what this system is, you know, if it's going to cost them $20,000, if that septic system ever, ever fails, they probably want to know that. So I would definitely, when they get their septic inspection done, have the um, septic inspector kind of walk them through what only, not only their septic system is, but sometimes the repair area system could be an entirely different kind of system. Just be aware of that. That's kind of a weird thing, but it, it could happen. So the last thing I want to show you on, on permitting is this. So this house 
is not on septic, it's actually on sewer. The cool thing is now um, for relatively recent builds, the county or pluris, uh, whoever is doing these are now putting the sewer permits in here as well, which is, is pretty cool because then you just have, again, that one more piece of information to give to your people. Uh, but what I want to make you aware of is just on top of it being cool and knowing who their sewer provider is and all of that kind of stuff is, are we I'm still thinking? Give me a second. Da, 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 da. Okay, while we're waiting, does anybody have any questions on septics or anything? We're going to be moving on to covenants next. So this will be an intention to provide sewer service. So you've got the utility company name and contact information, all of that kind of stuff, the address, the lot number, everything in there. Um, where are we? Oh, well, this one doesn't have it. Okay, well, I'm not gonna go through the, the time of pulling up another one, but a lot of times it will have a bedroom number here on here, even with sewer. Okay, so again, do be aware, just because they're in a neighborhood that has sewer, if they've got six kids, you probably do want to check this too. It's a lot easier to add sewer lines than it is to add a septic line. Um, it's usually just a couple thousand dollars um, to, to do that, uh, but it's better to catch at the beginning again than the end if they really need to add them. But do be aware that, you know, um, it does matter how many people live in a house, no matter what kind of system you're on. Um, it's just for slightly different reasons. They just want to make sure that they have enough water service and everything to get there for, for sewers. Okay, so that's our permitting page. But like I said, you, you can look around in here and, you know, pull all of those. And it's super cool to know everything that you can about, um, about the house that you guys are, uh, that your buyers are buying um, and all of that. So the last thing that we're going to check on this page, so again, we did GIS maps, we did e-services to go to permits. Now we're doing that same e-services button and we're going straight to deed books. So this should look familiar. This is what we were typing those book pages in. So the easiest way to find restrictive covenants is to click up here on advanced name. And again, this is all on the sheet you're going to get and then start typing in the neighborhood, okay? So let's say we're looking for restrictive covenants for Camden Woods. When you do that advanced search and type in the name of the subdivision, the only thing that's going to come up in here are restrictive covenants and plat maps, which helps out a lot because if you were to do it in a property search, and I'll show you how to do that as well, but if you were going to search the whole neighborhood, every deed and deed of trust that's come up in that neighborhood is also going to auto-populate. So if it is an older neighborhood or even if it's an established neighborhood, you could have like 200 records. It's a lot harder to go through than eight. Okay. But if you're just looking for restrictive covenants or maps, this is a great place to start is advanced name, type in the subdivision, and those will come up. If you'll notice, everything that comes up in the, the Register of Deeds site always comes up in order of date put in, oldest to newest. If you wanted the newest ones first, these are all filterable and you can move them around. You can, you can do all kinds of stuff in here, okay? So what I want you to be aware of on this, let's get the maps all in one and these all in one. So if you are in Camden Woods and let's say you were buying a house that's in Camden Woods section 1C, you're going to want to make sure that you give your people this one, the Camden Woods, the full restrictive covenants. And again, it's pretty good indication when it's 21 pages that those are a full set of covenants. But if they're in section 1C, you also want to make sure that they get this amendment. And I, if you click on that amendment, it'll say what it's amending to. Um, Go back up here. So this is this, it says second amendment to master declaration of restrictive covenants for Camden Woods. So what I, what you probably need to do is just make sure that there wasn't anything in either 1A or 1B that 1C needs to know. In general, that's kind of not how amendments work. You probably should only need this one and this one if you're in 1C. But if, uh, but if they aren't labeled 1A, 1B, 1C, this could very well just be an amendment that everybody needs. So again, just getting people a restrictive covenant 
is not the same as getting them all of their restrictive covenants. And on the deeds where I was saying, you know, it shows you that there are restrictive covenants. If it only listed this number, this 477399, well, that's great. And you can give your people that, but they don't have the restrictive covenants. The, all this is saying is that we're incorporating section 1C into the covenants. That's not really giving them any information. The information they actually need in the covenants is in here. So if you don't give them this 21 pages, you're not actually giving them all the information that they need. So just do be aware of that, that you, um, you wanna give them all of the restrictive covenants for the section that they're in. And again, if you are trying to be a reasonable and prudent agent and you just miss one of them, okay, you know, no, probably not going to lose your license over that. So what becomes important when you are looking at restrictive covenants? I know this is 32 pages and I know you're going to roll your eyes and say, well, I'm not going to read through all that. And in general, you'll get used to restrictive covenants after a while if you're not already. You probably don't need to read every word of every restrictive covenant, but um, and you'll you'll see what the important things are up here. It's always going to tell you what this is all about. But I'm going to show you because I know what pages we're looking for, and I'm just trying to keep this to a specific time and everything. This is the section I wanted you to look at. Okay, animals, no livestock, poultry. People always want chickens, unless they're household pets. Have to be on a leash. Have to be fenced. And this one, okay, prohibited dog breeds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, Mastiffs, Boxers, Bulldogs, Pitbulls, Chows, and Wolf Hybrids. So again, if your client has said the words, oh, I've got the cutest little, you know, I've got the cutest Doberman, and this is the neighborhood they want, if you see this in the restrictive covenants, I would have them be initialing right over here that they are well aware that this neighborhood does not allow Dobermans. Um, it is for insurance. I'm not going to go into whether it's right or not to restrict specific breeds. I, that, that's not my job here today. But just do know that there are things that show up in restrictive covenants. And again, if your people have ever said the words, this is important to me, it becomes important to you. And that's what you need to be looking at. Do you need to be an expert on every page of everyone, every um, restrictive covenant in the world? No, but as, as a realtor, if your um, buyers have said the words, this is extremely important to me, or this dog is my baby or whatever, you just need to make sure that you are helping them with their due diligence, oops, sorry about that, helping them with their due diligence and having them look for those things. Okay, so this one, um, now I'm, I'm going to kind of read through part of this and it's going to sound ridiculous but we'll go through why this is actually a um, fairly brilliant way to do this. Okay, so this one, again, we've got animal restrictions, okay? All right, inherently dangerous animal. In this neighborhood, you cannot have bats, wolves, wolf hybrids, lions, tigers, cheetahs, jaguars, cougars, leopards, snow leopards, clouded leopards, all hyena species. Now, I don't know why the leopards get called out individually by, you know, little group, but it's all hyena, but whatever. All bear, all apes, new and old world monkeys, persimmons, elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, sorry guys, no hippopotamus for Christmas, guar, bantang, cupre, anawa, cape buffalo, all crocodilia. Uh, okay, so you can't have a rhinoceros in a neighborhood anyway. I think we all know that. Um, and again, this may be ridiculous, but if this lightens up your, your day as you're reading through 38,000 pages of restrictive covenants and makes you laugh, it's probably worthwhile. Why this is a good way to do that though is comparing it to what we just saw where they specifically called out um, boxers, but did not call out the Jack Russell down the street who's bitten three kids. Okay, what this whole clause does when it's talking about animals and inherently dangerous is it's putting that clause in there, inherently dangerous. So what that means is if your Jack Russell bites three children, that animal is now an inherently dangerous animal and these restrictive covenants can now be enforced, even though it's not a Rottweiler or a Doberman or something that somebody at one point you know, some insurance agent said those are the only dangerous animals. No, this actually says that any animal can be considered a dangerous animal. So like I said, it, it's funny um, and a little ridiculous kind of, but at the same time, 
it it actually covers the problem a lot better than calling out specific breeds do, in my opinion. Okay. So shoot, there it is. Okay, so 45 pages. So this is a good one. Um, and again, there's, there's just things that you need to be looking for because you don't know what's important to people. But again, let's say you've got a client that has three young children and they, you know, you've shown them houses and these three kids are super active, including that, you know, mom brings like one of their little tiny razor scooters for a toddler with her when they, you know, get out of the car. So that baby can just roll down the street for a couple minutes and get out a little kind of burst of energy and all of that. You've seen all of this happen and then they want to build in or they want to buy in this neighborhood. And you see, hmm, that's not it. Who is it? Man, did I lose it? Uh, all right, we'll get back to it. Man, sorry guys. Uh, now I've lost it, but it basically says that you can't leave bikes on your yard. They have to be inside the garage. So again, it may not be great if they have young kids. And sorry, I can't find that. Um, but this section, Christmas decorations have to be down by January 7th. No flags on any common area except for state of North Carolina and United States of America. So who of our clients might have a problem with that when they can't fly their Marine Corps flag? You know, so there's just things that you need to be looking for. And again, it's when, especially when your people have said that this is important to them. Okay. The last thing I want to go over is sometimes you'll get a book and page number from like um, a deed or something like that, that, um, and you type it in here. So let's see, this one is, and oh, no results. That's weird, you know, and you're, you're questioning it. And then you realize that it's a slightly older neighborhood. So you've got this, what this actually says is book page 1977. And that is a year, the year of 1977 to current. And then you have this one, 1734 to 1976. And you realize that this neighborhood you're looking in was actually built before 1976. So then if you go in here, hold on, I gotta move this again. And you then you have to, this is in here a little bit different. So you're looking at 482 and 164. And it's thinking. So now it's coming up. All right. But do be aware that sometimes the um, for these in the older sections. So every time we've typed in a book and page number before it's come up real nice here at the top of the page. Um, long, long ago, these used to be run on ones instead. So let me show you what that looks like. So if you're looking for covenants in. Um, is just an example. If you're looking for something on um, this page, huh, you know, good luck. You gotta try to read that and everything. But it just went page to page and it didn't necessarily start with a deed on each new page. So do be aware that if you might have the correct book and page number, look at the entire page because it may be halfway down the page. Um, I think I have a better example of that though. Twelve to loading, loading. So yeah, so this one, like you're like, I swear this is the right one, but this doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. You just have to go down a little bit further. The restrictive covenants actually start halfway down the page. Okay, so they used to just run them all together rather than putting them on a separate page. So just be aware of that. The last one that I want to go over. Um, so fair housing is, you know, has always been a, a, a big issue. And, you know, a lot of things have always been a big issue. Um, but, you know, we get questions about this and whether we need to re-record covenants and stuff every once in a while. Um, and the answer to that is no, federal law trumps anything that could be in a restrictive covenant too. But just do be aware that, you know, it's possible. Oh. 
Sorry, I had it written down where. Grr, sorry guys. Amy, while you're looking for that, there is a question in the chat box and it's so the restrictive covenants from that long ago are still in place. Uh, possibly. And I'll show you what that what that actually says. So this is what I was looking for. So letter H, no persons of any race other than Caucasian shall use or occupy any building or lot except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants. OK. This has not been valid since, you know, long, long, long ago. So just because it says this in the restrictive covenants does not mean that that is enforceable, that that is, you know, correct at all or anything like that. But the covenants do not need to be re-recorded because the federal law saying that that's not a thing um, definitely trumps this. But a lot of times what you'll see in restrictive covenants, and I thought it was in here, uh, but basically, I want to try to end this in about four minutes, um, but it basically says in restrictive covenants that this, um, these restrictive covenants are good for 10 years and after 10 years they need to be um, reinforced. So always look into that um, and a, a good place to do a good thing to do is, you know, talk to neighbors and really ask them because sometimes, you know, like my my particular neighborhood has a bunch of restrictive covenants and there's like different ones for every section, like completely different ones. Like the first area, like the first 10 houses do have breed restrictions. None of the rest of the houses in the neighborhood do. So are German shepherds actually restricted from the first 10 houses of the neighborhood and not the rest? We don't have an HOA to enforce it anyway. Like what, you know, so again, these are things that the real estate commission says the buyer has the right to know they they have a right to know what follows their property so it's your job to get these to them but i do truly believe that it is their due diligence to take it further if they need to it's their due diligence to read all 45 pages of those restrictive covenants it's their due diligence to ask questions to do all that stuff it's not your job to point out absolutely every little thing it's your job to get them the tools that they need the public records that they need, the information that they need. And if they specifically ask you questions to help them with, definitely help them. But it is their due diligence. This is a buyer beware state, all of that, all of that. But it is our job to help give them as much information as possible. So the last thing that I want to go over today is um, pulling roads. So that's a completely different website. Again, that it is in your, um, it's on that sheet. So don't worry about all of that. Um, but it's the NCDOT website. The tricky thing on this, and it is on the list, when you're typing in road name, be very broad, okay? So you just want to type in things like golden eye. Okay, and where it says road number here, this is not the street address. So if the street address of this house is 111 East Golden, I do not type 111 in here. That is not what that means. I'll show you what it means. But when you submit that, if this comes up and I'm actually looking in Onslow County and nothing comes up, there's your indication that these might be private roads. And in fact, this one is, if I went back to the plat map and looked at it, it would, this is Mimosa Bay, and it would say that these are private roads and that they're maintained by the HOA. So again, I just wanna make sure that the lender gets that information, that these are private roads and that they are maintained by the HOA. And I want them to see that right away so they can tell me whether it's going to be a problem for them or not. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, so let's do, this. So this one, it's actually like Mango Place South is the name of the street. So if I typed in Mango Place South, I'm going to get no records found. If I type in Mango Place S, no records found. How about just Mango PL? There they are. But look how this is. This is the other side of the street. This one's written in here by DOT as Mango PL S. This is typed out Mango Place North. So why I was saying use the simplest thing is to just type in mango, both of them come up, okay? So simpler is better on this 
on this sheet and that's all on the sheet that you're gonna get. So what that road number is, is this. This is the number that's on the top of the green road sign that you see. You'll see it say 2630. So if, uh, if DOT needed to go make a repair, they know this street as 2630. They don't know that it's called Mango Place South, okay? So it's kind of like builders with lot numbers. If you tell a builder 123 Main Street, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. But if you say lot one Main Street Plaza, they'll know what you mean. So the same thing with DOT. They go by these road numbers. We go by this. Where this becomes important, if this is not a state-maintained road, bus drivers cannot go down this. So your schools will have to pick up at entrances and everything. Um, if you're in a new construction neighborhood that's going half and half. So this is Camden Woods. Mango Place has been turned over to the state, but in that same neighborhood, just, you know, walking distance, not even walking, like the next street over is Piedmont. It has not been turned over to the state yet. So the school bus would have to stop by Mango. It wouldn't be able to drive all the way to Piedmont. And this just, so Piedmont and Gilcrest and all of that, Gilcrest has been turned over halfway, but not the whole way. So again, it can become important for a couple different things, but if you had a buyer who is buying on Piedmont, there will be a little blurb up in the top of the plat map that says streets are intended to be turned over to the state. Um, that's usually good enough for a lender that that intention, if it's not, you might have to fight with them or your buyer might have to find a lender who's a little bit more reasonable. <laughs> I don't know. But um, that's usually good enough, especially if you could go and show them the flat map and say, okay, but look, Mango has been turned over. This one will be as soon as the street is done. They'll usually listen to you, okay? The other thing to be aware of, so Warlick Street in Jacksonville. No records found, what? Okay, this is city. This is NCDOT. This is state of North Carolina. The city of Jacksonville maintains this street, not the state of North Carolina, okay? So you don't need to come up with um, road maintenance agreements when you're inside city limits, if that makes sense, okay? So it's not gonna come up on DOT. That doesn't mean that the road is not um, governmentally maintained. It just means that it's not the state, it's a city. Okay. So that is all I have. We're right at two hours. Thanks for sticking with us if you did. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? I still don't know why my chat won't come up. All right. Thank and you for your time today. We sure. appreciate it very much. And if anybody does have any questions, um, like I said, I'll, I'll throw my stuff in here if you want to write it down. Um, but like I said, you can search it in Flex if you don't know how to do that. Take Flex classes from us. We will we'll definitely show you that. But if you do have any questions and you can't figure out how to get a hold of me, definitely just call over or email over to JPOR and they can put you in touch with me. Heather will be sending out um, the step-by-steps for how to do all of this. If you find any you know, corrections that need to be made to that, please let me know. If you have any other questions after you've sat down and kind of gone through that, because this is what it's going to take. It's going to take all of you like playing around in these systems and really learning it as soon as you do. Then if you have other questions, that's definitely a great, great time to, to ask me as well, or to just, you know, chit chat amongst, you know, I saw Ray Evans' whole office was, was all sitting there. So definitely, you know, talk amongst yourselves and try to figure some of this out too. I hope everybody learned at least something. Hopefully that's what I always go for with any of these classes is if there's just one little thing that you can take away that will make your life easier or better or stop you from going to real estate jail, which is a really nice way of saying losing your license, which we definitely don't wanna do. Um, we just want you to have all of that information. All right, well, I will let everybody go if there's nothing there, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for attending. Please pass on the information and that worksheet to anybody, anybody, anybody who could possibly benefit from it. I really do appreciate all of you that are, you know, really making a commitment to, to learn and to make your businesses better. It definitely helps to make everybody the best co-brokes that we can possibly have, so. We will see you guys all soon. We've got lots of stuff coming up. Look for stuff coming out from Heather on what's coming up. We've got lots happening, guys. So make sure you check out that education hub that I shared earlier. It's got everything posted. 
Um, we have quite a bit that's happening next month. And we are going to do, I believe, a virtual Texpo coming in April. So be on the lookout for all that information very soon. So thank you, Amy, again. Um,